klapper. Ja, det var just <laughs> cameraman clapping. Hey guys, welcome to our podcast. Today we have here uh, e. E. Jan McCollum. Jan, Jan, Jan. McCollum. Yeah. Uh, I guess he's a YouTuber, maybe one of those more unknown ones. Uh, so what do you do? I do videos on gun-related content. <laughs> on ub <Ubi-tubi? laughs> Perfect. Uh, but on a more serious note, um, I really am interested. How did you start your channel and, and was it always this your focus or just involved to what it is now? So it actually started as a website, specifically. Um, and the, the origin was the friend of a friend of mine uh, was an engineer for Colt. And he, he died. And in his attic, he had taken home a ton of original documents from Colt from the, like the 50s and 60s on the AR because they were being thrown away. And this guy recognized the, the relevance and the, the historical importance. And so he saved them in his attic. And then he died and whoop, family threw him away. Um, this was followed by a very similar incident with a guy who had collected documentation on the Pedersen device. You know the Pedersen device. Yes. You know, I there do. are four. Actually, I only know it because of you. There are four Pedersen devices. They built the one for the Springfield. They designed them for the Enfield, the LaBelle, and the Mosin. This guy found documents on the other three as well. Same deal. Papers in the attic. Guy dies. Family goes, what's this nonsense? Whoop. Out it goes. So uh, a friend and I got the idea like, you know, maybe we could do something to, to archive this to prevent it from getting lost. And so I started a website basically using my friend's gun collection, gun and documentation collection as a, an initial starting source of material. And it was a lot of archival photos, documents, reports, that sort of thing. And I started looking at stranger, weird guns. And it became very clear that it's very difficult to describe like a Shogren shotgun in a text article. How does it work? Like, good luck writing that. It's, it's a, yeah but it's a lot easier to do it on video. I can just show how things work very easily. And so uh, a year or so probably after I started the website, I started making the occasional video on weird mechanisms. And at the time, of course, I'm hosting the website, I'm paying for a server to host the website, and I can't afford to pay for the bandwidth to host video. Like, holy shit, what am I made of money? Well, there was this, this stupid company out there called YouTube, that were obviously complete suckers because they would host it for free. <laughs> and so I started hosting video on YouTube and then I'd embed the link in my own website and boom, free video hosting. Uh, and it, it grew from there to after a few years, it kind of turned into an exclusively video channel. I still run the website. I still, like every video has a text component that's posted on the website. I saw that and I, I respect that. I think that They takes a lot oh. of time or not? Yeah. It's an annoying part of the work, to be honest. Oh. Um, But you stick to it. That's awesome. But I keep doing it. Yeah. When did the I'm like when did the auction house and stuff came into the your daily world basically? It had to have been like 2015, I think. I think it was 2015. I'd have to go back and look at the exact dates to no, be sure. But, but, still, but that was kind of a game changer. Yeah, exactly. So, The deal was I had a, a contact, a collector, who kept bugging me to go visit the Rock Island Auction Company. Because the day before their auction, they put everything out, and it's like a giant gun show. Mm -hmm. Anyone can go in, you can look at anything, you can handle anything, there, everything's available, like there's no glass, the pistols are behind glass, but they'll open anything you want. <clears throat> and the idea is, okay, if you want to bid on a gun, you can look at it and examine it, make sure that you know what it is. Well, I went in there, like, I blew this guy off for a while because like it's it's like 2,000 miles for me to fly to Illinois to do this and finally I had a trip where I was able to basically stop at Rock Island very easily at a, on a preview day and I went in with this little totally crummy potato cam basically and found some employee and went hey do you mind if I make some videos and they're like whatever okay didn't know Didn't know me from Adam. This was, I was still a tiny, tiny YouTube channel at this point. And I made something like eight videos in one day. And they're still on the channel. They're some of the really early ones and they're all like three minutes long because I didn't really know, I had no idea what to expect at the auction. And so it was all done off the top of my head. Like, what do I know about this gun? Um, 
and I started posting those like one, maybe once a week, I think. And a month or two later, Rock Island contacted me and they're like, hey, we saw that you're posting video from our auction house and like they're getting some views. But it doesn't do us any good because the auction happened the day after you filmed them. Um, how would you, we, we'd like to bring you down. We'll pay your expenses to come down if you want to film before the auction and publish the videos in the lead up to the auction so that we can get mm. some benefit from it. And I thought that sounded like a fantastic idea. And so I did a trip like that. And a week after they started publishing, it was this, <laughs> it was this, uh, this waiting game. Like, okay. I, I really want to keep doing this and I'd like them to pay me to do it too, if <laughs> possible. But I don't want to be, I don't want to like email them too soon and seem too eager. Cause push, then, yeah. right. Cause I don't want to scare them off, but I also don't want to like totally wait. And then maybe they think I won't be interested. And so I'm a week after the auction, I'm debating like, should I call them yet or not? Yeah. No, no, no. And they called me and they're like, went great. You want to do it again and we'll pay you. And At least for the, probably travels <laughs> yeah and so that was the beginning of my work with rock island um i think after my first session of filming with rock island i was contacted by their at the time basically arch nemesis the james julia auction company who was interested in the same thing so i started working for those guys as well uh, and that gave me the opportunity to film enough content that i could start doing video every day so for you what would be that pivot point is it the auction houses? Is it just the start of the channel? Is it the collaboration with in range? Is it, I don't know, brutalities? I don't know. What would you define as the pivot point of your channel? Um, well, there have been a number of pivot points for the work overall. Um, starting to work with the auction houses was definitely an inflection point for the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Because at, at first, I couldn't, I, I wasn't doing a video every day, but in the month before an auction, I would do a video every day. And then it, it lapsed back down to like two per week until there was another auction. And for a while I was doing five auctions a year. So that's mm -hmm. basically five months of daily content. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. level of quantity really had an impact on the YouTube algorithm. And that's mm -hmm. what let the, that, that started the channel really growing. But that's exactly what I was thinking. So quantity actually helped your channel. Yes, it, absolutely. We have to definitely mention for people that maybe don't watch your videos that much, but like your videos are, are quality made not in the cinematic sense that much but the information how you convey that information um that's amazing so all of your videos are, they are not you know like some over the top but if someone is interested in in a gun like that like even if you just google it not even search it on youtube your videos will come up yeah and and that's amazing so my focus my intention is to to cover the information to the absolute the best that i can mm -hmm. and i have uh, adequate production values but nothing special at all which is deliberate because if i had high production values um like the multiple camera multiple microphone <laughs> setup we have for this podcast just the time that it takes to set that up and tear it down I wouldn't be able to do that volume of content. And uh, to finalize the question I wanted to ask you is just what was that defining moment when you said like, shit, I can do this for, <laughs> for like full time? Oh, that was, that was actually before I got to this point in the video scheme. So mm -hmm. when I started doing it full time, I think my, my biggest single income source was Amazon affiliate referral mm -hmm. money, which has completely fallen off a cliff for me. Like today it's like, you know, $30 a month or something. That's enough for uh, me. I buy my own hotel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I got to the point where I was still doing the website. So I was selling banner ads on the website. Mm -hmm. I had Amazon affiliate links when I did book reviews. I was posting a video at that point, probably about once per week. <clears throat> and it got to the point where there was potential to it, but if I really, if I wanted to make it grow, I had to, I had to spend more time. At this point, I had a full-time job working for a solar power company and I was doing this mornings and evenings. And it was actually my wife who saw the real potential in it more than I did. And she looked at it and said, tell you what, I think this could be something big. So I will cover all of our household expenses. You quit your job and do this website full-time, like work from home, do it full-time. Um, the deal is, however, when it becomes very successful, you have to hire me away from my corporate job. Uh, and I looked at that deal as fantastic because 
I didn't really think it was ever going to be that successful. <laughs> like, great, I'm never going to have to make good on this deal. And now she's Done. the one looking at this deal as fantastic. Yes, she is. Uh, <laughs> we both at this point kind of worry that the other will discover that we've each gotten the better side of the deal. <laughs> <laughs> so it's worked out very well for that. Awesome. That's that's a really nice to hear. I think with, uh, let me just add in, I think yeah. with entrepreneurship like that, when you're building your own business, everyone comes to this point where it's a leap of faith mm -hmm. like you have to do more spend more time on your thing but it is not making enough money you cannot afford to quit doing your actual income generating thing exactly. but if you will not you will not have the time That's exactly exactly and same story with us it's basically you have to close your eyes and take the step somehow yeah. and do it it's basically what you americanski people say uh, catch 22 <clears throat> yeah a little bit when you but when you jump out of it you can do shit yeah yeah now to a more serious question from one of our patrons that was a funny question adam asks what conditioner do you use for such a good hair <laughs> i don't even know i don't remember whatever is like i like, use conditioner oh you do yeah yeah i, do. I don't even know what yeah. conditioner is like i it's, it's um, for me it's soap it's so it's, it's like it's, shampoo but it doesn't make suds it doesn't make bubbles and if I don't use it, my hair gets staticky and really hard to brush and a huge pain. Oh, I do not know what it is problems, chemically. But no, you, you don't. <laughs> because you have two inches of hair. But, but like, I don't have a specific brand. I just use. As long as I use conditioner, I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, another question from our patron, Tom, the French guy. Yeah. That was hey, fine Tom. for the first six hours since you know, talked just a little bit too much. <laughs> but he, again, has uh, some questions. So, with the United States going back towards better rifles and full-powered cartridges, um, do you see maybe um, a, a rise of constant recoil type of systems or something e similar getting developed, maybe something with magnetic locked balls, bolt or other, fun other funky ideas? I think he means in a sense of trying to reduce the, reduce the felt recoil, you know? No. No. So... No. Elaborate. Okay. So constant recoil is only a thing on fully automatic fire. And the transition... Why? I'll ask this question. Mm. Why? Um, because... So what constant recoil does is it sets up a system where you, you ascent, the gun is essentially creating a constant steady force of recoil. Instead of peaks and valleys of recoil. So mm -hmm. if you're shooting an AK, it's bam, forward, bam, forward. Constant recoil, a gun like an Ultimax, you get, when you pull the trigger, you're gonna get a push back, but then it's it's this very stable recoil force yeah. until yeah. you let go of the trigger. So it's boom, tonk, when you stop. Uh, in semi-auto, constant recoil is meaningless. It, it doesn't function in semi-auto. And so, with a transition to battle rifles, we're essentially removing any real impetus to have full auto in the infantry rifle because it's just, you're, you're, you don't carry enough ammunition. The guns are too powerful to have any real practical value in burst fire. I know there are people out there who are gonna be like, oh, I'm fire my M14, great, full mag dumps, two inches at 50 meters, whatever. Here, I have to disagree on the constant recall. Yeah, I, I know what you mean with a constant recall, but usually constant recoil is achieved by the bolt not hitting the back of the receiver, correct? That's a part of it, yeah. That's a part of it. Yeah. Uh, in semi-automatic fire, that can have advantage on the recoil. Yes. Because that's what I did with my AK. It's overgassed, and instead of like reducing the gas, I increase the spring pressure. Okay. And that way, I can reduce the, not the felt recoil, recoil essentially stays the same because it's the right. opposite force of the bullet. But what you reduce is the ball carrier hitting the receiver and having that, you know, jarring jump of the rifle. I um, totally understand what you're saying and you're completely correct. I just wouldn't call that constant recoil. Okay, so it's semantics. Constant recoil is a slightly more, it's like one step beyond that. I understand that. Yeah. also balancing um, the, the travel time of the of the mm -hmm. bolt. So. And so for constant recoil, it's only in full automatic fire. Yeah. Because that's because because only at that time it's constant. Exactly. I know what you mean. Because yeah. if for, for unlucky people that never shot with an Ultimax or something similar, 
when you start to shoot at it, you get some recoil, and then it's like you're holding a whole hose, yeah. hosing yeah. with water. It's a constant pressure that you can easily control. Yeah. Um, hmm. um, as for magnetic stuff, I don't think we will ever see a magnetically locked action. Magnets have a lot of problems. For one thing, it seems like a cool physical phenomena, but the amount of force that you can exert with magnets is far too small to actually lock a bolt. Like you need such a massive mass of magnet that it's just impractical in a firearm. In addition, you know what things tend to cause magnetism to dissipate? Heat and physical impact. Like um, that, That's a very good point. I never thought about it like that, but um, there, I think the use of magnets will be more prevalent in, in, in future firearms. Um, what I was really amazed by was the new buffer. Now it's known as the Mitsulek buffer, but I know that some other US company invented it. Essentially just neodymium magnets. Mm -hmm. They are uh, in reverse polarity. And when the buffer comes almost to the end of the travel, the magnet stops it before touching. I can and see an application for that. Yeah, yeah. and like uh, the, the feeling of that is very similar to a hydraulic buffer. Okay. It really helps with, you know, like dampening that striking of the buffer on the buffer tube. So. Okay. Samo, do you need to smoke already? Yes, uh, I just told our... Five minutes into the podcast. No, it's like 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, shut up. Uh, I'm really, I'm, I'm really liking this, by the way, because uh, Giga finally found somebody to talk on the <laughs> same autistic level, and I'm really. And now really he's happy. not trying to bug you about it. No, it's just like <laughs> I can be in the middle and just don't care. I'm, just, I'm, I'm amazed <laughs> about the conversation you guys are having. I'm, maybe I'm really maybe you should now ask him some non-gun related okay. questions. So we. What is your sh side shoe? Uh, shoe of size? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm joking. No. Um, what I wanted to dig in a little bit more about is you're an American yes. and you came to the Middle East. <laughs> this is Eastern Europe. <laughs> Eastern Europe. Uh, it is a joke. Uh, no, I just wanted to ask you, like, I, I know you're not the average American. I would say you're, you, you have traveled the world, definitely. And he's cultured. He's cultured. <laughs> But this is the first time you are in our area, especially your. This is the first time you are, kind of in the Balkans. It is, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you a little bit more, if you can elaborate. What's the feeling like? What shocked you basically? Was the neg, neg in negative way or in a positive way? So I did almost. N I did essentially no background research on Slovenia before I came here. I was. I was busy researching guns that I was going to be filming here and making sure that I had all the content edited and uploaded and pre-scheduled during the trip and, and then whoosh on the plane. Um, <laughs> and the thing that really honestly struck me as we were, as the airplane was coming down to land in uh, Ljubljana was how incredibly gorgeous the country is. Like it's surrounded by these beautiful forested mountains that, it makes sense. I asked people about it and they're like, oh yeah, it's like you have Alps and on one side you have like Austria going into the Alps and then this is the same thing geographically on the other side. Yeah. Um, I think most people, certainly I didn't expect that this part of former Yugoslavia looks like freaking the Austrian Alps, but it does and it's beautiful and the city itself is full of green spaces, very clean. Um, not that I came in with any particular huge prejudice, but like, yeah, I know. you hear Balkans and you're like... Yeah, you thought you yeah. were going to the war zone. I don't know how it's going to be bad, but it's going to be like, bad somehow, right? <laughs> and no, it's, it's a beautiful city and I've had a great time here. Awesome. What was the best thing you have done? As, and you cannot say uh, Link's Brutality. Oh. Like... Honestly, can, that was the highlight of my time. I know, in but Slovenia. you can. You but of course, it would be. Everyone knew that. That's why. You're yes, doing. we can go from food to drinks to just <laughs> so. strolling the city. Just a little detail, but anything, anything not gun related or links related. Oh well, that's bad because my backup answer was going to be visiting RX Defense. Oh no, okay. Which was a similar thing where it's like, okay, we're going to go visit this company that they've started making a polymer pistol. Yeah, yeah that's cool. We get there, and it turns out. They've been around like forever. They've been making OEM parts for FN for decades. Mm -hmm. They've got more 
manufacturing capacity in-house than I saw at some other really significant gun companies that everyone would recognize. Like, oh yeah, we have our own cold hammer forged barrel making process here that we do completely in-house. And yeah, we do all of our own polymer molding too and all of our own design and we make our own polymer molds. Well, it was like, And by the way, we have crap. like 300, 400 employees. Yeah, it was a far more sophisticated and um, full-featured factory than I had any expectation of. I am actually really cool. looking forward to that video. Oh, yeah. Because I was there behind Ian and there was also Grega from AREX. And kind of Greg at first tried to explain some of the, the <laughs> procedures, how the guns are made and some of the, uh, the machines. But I think you have some technical background because you knew all of it. <laughs> and then Greg just came to me and said like, you know, I'm listening to Ian and maybe I'll, I'm actually learning some new <laughs> stuff about our machines and the processes. <laughs> and, and what we really both like is how you were able to convey this in English, like explain what they're doing there and in such an elegant way, oh. simplified, but still not, you know, not butchering the actual process. So, you know, it was technically correct, but anyone can understand. And, and I'm really looking forward to that video. That, that would be nice. That's going to be a fun one. It helps. I've done a couple of firearm factory tours before, and I do have, um, you know, a CNC machining, a bit of CNC machining education background. I've done it. Uh, not hmm. professionally so much, but like I've done that work. I've programmed CNCs, I've run them, I've run firearms production tooling. So when you put me in a gun factory, I know what I'm looking at when What's I see happening, the different parts. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, for, a, for a question that I always kind of despise and hate. Um, How are you? But I have to ask, um, if you could have only one gun. From us. Next From question. Us. Really? <laughs> Why? No. Okay, honestly, this is going to sound like cheap shilling. Honestly, it would be a what would Stoner do carbine. That's a perfectly legit answer. Because Why? Because for me, it does the most number of things the best. I think there would be a really good argument to be made for a pistol. Like kind of any generic full size or Glock 19 size pistol because you can carry it and it can do things that a rifle can't but I enjoy rifles more than I enjoy pistols. I like pistol shooting, but I'm, I just gravitate towards rifles. So that what would Stoner do is more accurate than I am. It is super light and handy. Like everything about it, literally, I put my, you know, half of it is my ideas of what a single best rifle should be. So that is a perfect take. answer. That's a good answer. And we actually tried it uh and it's a for the definitely for the size and especially for the weight is remarkably zero recoil it's yeah. amazing amazing rifle now that being said if my house is on fire i'm grabbing the famas first yeah because i can get another what would stoner do i can't get another famas very easily without yep. like selling yep. Yep. my car <laughs> yeah i understand that it, it's i think we we spoke about this before links, after links, but um, the HK MP7, right? You don't yeah. really care that much for it. No, not a huge I fan. I kind of like also don't really care much for it, but if I could get only one gun now, right? Like I can get it for free, it'll be MP7. Just like it's so rare, it, it's really expensive, it's hard to get, you know, like, but yeah, yeah I understand you in kind of this kind of way. Um, that was a very good answer. Now we're going back to Tom, our patron. Okay. <laughs> you only well, have more the, questions. You only have the one, so, right? But uh, I'm sorry to <laughs> yeah. disrupt you, but like Tom, you were with us at Link's Brutality for two days. You could answer and. Uh, no, he was already talking too much. <laughs> I think he, he would be great together with Matei. Yes. They could be talking for but days. But you know, monologue on mono monologue is not a conversation, I always say. Um, let's condense this into one question Why are you what is the most interesting to you interesting forgotten or failed system with guns mm. that's a good or question. just not doesn't have to be failed let's just say like what's the most interesting operating system or interesting gun so did you have operating system is probably going to be long recoil because they just have the most parts and they're kind of the most 
They're not quite the most alien. The most alien systems are the inertial delayed or inertially locked systems like Shogrins and like those things are just some sort of dark magic inside and inertial they work. delayed. Yeah. How does it work? So sort of the, the rough idea is you have a mass that's locking the bolt in place and there's a spring behind it. And when you fire, the gun moves backward, but inertia causes, actually spring in front of it, inertia causes this block to stay where it is. An object in, at rest will stay at rest. Mm -hmm. And then the gun recoils, moves around it, behind it, and that relative movement between the two parts causes the thing to unlock. It, it's like the Benelli B-76 is like that. The Shogren is like that. They're just... What about your gun? Space it's magic. actually Benelli, Benelli shotguns, yeah. the M3. Yeah. I think it has something like that because it yes. has a, a rotating ball that locks. Mm -hmm. And then you have a very strong spring between the, the bolt and the bolt carrier. Yeah. And essentially, when it recalls, uh, when it goes, when the bolt stays here, the bolt carrier stays here and compresses the spring. And when it... The whole gun recoils, but the bolt stays here and, yeah. you know, kind of unlocks and then all of it goes back. That was, yep. that was mind blowing to see on slow motion. And um, we figured that if this is really what's happening, um, if you put that gun uh, on a, a, a very hard and unmovable surface and fire... It shouldn't cycle. And it doesn't. Yeah. That was like, <laughs> for me. Yeah. So that's, that was... <laughs> that's the most alien... I like long recoil systems better because they're just there's more stuff moving around that you can take apart and play with. What about what? What's the the system called where the whole barrel and everything goes back <laughs> and then the bolt stays in place and barrel goes forward? That's long recoil. Oh, that's yeah. long recoil. Yeah, that's yeah. that's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so the advantage to them is they're super safe because the thing stays locked so long that chamber pressure is like nothing by the mm -hmm. time they finally mm -hmm. open they always have what looks there's so many people out there who have like you learn one thing and then you focus on it ejection from long recoil guns is incredibly weak they just kind of go Pugh, because there's no movement oh yeah like, so the ejection is exactly it's just like uh, the force of the spring pushing the barrel forward and then it, uh, okay. yeah. yeah 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 so they they have what looks like extremely weak ejection but that's appropriate Normal. for long recoil hmm. um, and there's so much moving that they tend to be like susceptible to reliability problems because there's so much space for friction and accuracy problems if you don't get perfect realignment of everything and we haven't like there's there is one company allegedly doing a long recoil ak and i honestly do not understand why they would do it except just to make something different but most of the time we're talking about like 1900 to World War One era guns. Shoshas, Frommer Stops, uh, Winchester, uh, Browning Auto Fives. That, that's one of the things that you mentioned. I wanted to ask, you know, about re uh, about accuracy, because it seems like any kind of design that you make where the barrel moves, it inherently comes with bad accuracy. Do you maybe know what was the like a modern submachine gun kind of thing? Uh, Grand Thumb tested it, an American company produces it, which has kind of a moving barrel. Ah, oh, looks very similar to the UMP. I have you no idea. Know. Sorry. Well, that, that, yeah. You don't, <laughs> you don't watch Grand Thumb in his uh, videos? Sorry. <gasps> Shame. 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 I, I watched his <laughs> SIG uh, Spear video. Oh, yeah. Long enough. I, he posted his first. I wanted to make sure I could add material that he didn't have. <laughs> and discovered, of course, that he was shooting literally the exact same gun that I had. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. There's one company, uh, Illuminated Arms, got one of those rifles because they only sold, I think, 27 of them on the market. And Illuminated, I think they, I don't know for sure, but I think they got this idea that, like, here's how we can get some publicity for our company. We take this rifle and then we mail it to everybody. But that's so, a good idea. I, I think so. It was fantastic for me to be able to have a chance yeah. to and, shoot and it. And the viewers get really cool content. Yep. And, and they get so a they lot get of, a yeah, lot of different win. perspectives on it. Yeah. yeah. 
So I would like to continue this conversation or the question Me too. with, uh, <laughs> well, maybe my question is different to yours, Giga, but uh, for you, which doesn't really matter, but century, whatever, but which firearm for you would be like, how wasn't this successful in sales and like how is not this a legendary awesome pistol rifle whatever um that everybody has at home you know what i mean that's a good question like what should have been successful and, exactly. wasn't? and it wasn't like nobody knows about it but it sh everybody should know about the, it the best example i've found is the schwarzlosa 1898 Great. I Which, didn't know that. Wow. Exactly. <laughs> We're off to a good start here. So Schwarzlosa was a talented Austrian designer. Mm -hmm. um, he's, his most successful thing was the, the 1907 and 0712 machine gun that was the standard World War I heavy machine gun for the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Which is also super cool. It's a delayed blowback, belt-fed heavy machine gun, water-cooled. A beautiful gun inside. But he designed a pistol that was, it used a rotating bolt. It had it was a single stack magazine, eight rounds, 763 Mauser, so modern, good pressure cartridge, and it had the er, it had ergonomics that you could put it on the market today. Hmm. Like it feels great in the hand. You've got two levers on the side, like one's a safety, one's a slide stop. It's a really beautiful it's it's a gorgeous looking gun. I actually had the chance to shoot one of them. It shot nicely. A few malfunctions because they made, I don't know, a couple hundred of them, if that. Plus also old. Yeah, and it's 1898 pattern. So this thing was oh, 110 it. years old when I was and, shooting. And to continue the question, uh, in your opinion, what went wrong? So I don't know exactly. I have suspicions. And I think it was basically an issue of the company didn't have the resources to pursue everything. And they probably thought that one of their other projects, and I don't know which one it would have been at the time, had more long-term potential. Mm -hmm. and it's like, look, all we, we have to pick one of these that we're gonna focus on. And if we pick the wrong one, like the company is gonna stagnate mm -hmm. for five years. And so they ended up not choosing the pistol, which may have been the right, de right decision. We, don't, don't, know. Know. we um, don't know. It's one of those guns that I think could be, one of very few guns I think could be built as a reproduction, maybe, and, and succeed. The, the problem is nobody knows about it because it was a complete commercial flop. I think we need to do... Fuck you, Jan! Fuck you! <laughs> you bitch! We need a short commercial break <laughs> to figure out the cameras. We are back from a short break. <laughs> <laughs> there were some slight technical difficulties, but uh, let's continue. Uh, I yes. don't know if you uh, saw that, but um, a couple of months ago, uh, us, Brandon Herrera and Henry from Nine Hole Reviews, we all made video about the AK-12. Yes. Almost on the same weekend. <laughs> yep. um, unrelated, not with the same guns, just it was quite a coincidence. But mm, the mind blowing mm, thing was. Of course, total coincidence. Oh, yeah, yeah. We all believe that it's just a coincidence. <clears throat> um, what is it? The uh, Leviathan Media Group owns us all. <laughs> they, they control us. So. They sent you all AK 12s. <laughs> <laughs> that would be an actually good deal. That, I would, I would that, sign immediately. Yes, I, yes, but, I might consider um, that myself. To continue with that, uh, what, what was really mind-blowing to me was that uh, we kind of came to the same conclusion. Um, I don't want to tell what it is, but what I I'm interested to know is what are your thoughts on the AK-12? Did you have the chance to handle one, shoot with one? Nope. I've never touched an AK-12. And when I saw all three of you guys doing it at the same time, I'm like, well, I'm not going to even bother looking for one for a while. Uh, it, yeah, yeah. But that was interesting. Like, that was for us very interesting because we have already made the video or filmed it when Giga said, you know, not the F word, but darn it, you know, they're also making one. So Oh, and, and people don't maybe, maybe don't know, but um, uh, Grantham also posted something about the AK-12 on his uh, Instagram mm -hmm. a couple of days later. And Krebs Customs had an AK-12 at their shop and they were 
pretty much just taking photos of the whole rifle and, and doing a lot of text, you know, like explaining, oh, this is the mag, this is this, how it works together. And there was, uh, I think, Travis Haley also posted something <laughs> with AK-12, like, I, I, it was in the same week. But uh, I don't know about the Americans, but for us, it's definitely a coincidence because it was a coincidence being in Austria where we were with Austria Arms and they have Actually, bunch of... Actually, we were there uh, with um, uh, the, the Air Software, the, no, with no, Norwich Yeah, but guys. it was completely irrelevant, <laughs> not irrelevant, but we were there for completely something different and just, you know, by coincidence or because they asked us, like, you, you want to check their shop, shop out? And we said, yeah, sure. And I and see it on the wall and said, yeah, I want to shoot with so that. So it was, <laughs> like, for us, it was completely different, uh, uh, a coincidence, but I don't know for the Americans. So my plan now is, eventually, when the war in Ukraine is over, I'd like to, to visit Ukraine yeah, and do too. some filming with some of their domestic stuff and some of the cool stuff that used to be Russian and is yes. now Ukrainian. Uh, so <laughs> in, we, we are in the same, we, we are linked. We, like, I agree with you, but I'm there for buying things <laughs> oh yeah well, we'll, uh, we'll set up an export import company yes. go there help rebuild ukraine also get rid of illegal guns there you know yes. like uh, help why, out. why did you charter a, a cargo <laughs> ship to odessa first of all lower your voice <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny by the way in slovenia the slovenian government paid a couple of million of euros to get rid of some ak's and stuff they should have um, should have called you well or me any any private owner in Slovenia would be happy to buy them not you know they shouldn't pay stuff and then there it was a controversy uh, cont controversial controversial yes because one of those firearms were in was found in Africa so you know just call us we will uh, we will buy it anyway I'll film not one of the American rebuilt kids but eventually i'll get into ukraine i'll film a, a captured russian military ak-12 yeah well the the one that we did video uh, that's always you'll always have people commenting like oh that was not a real ak-12 oh. that was something something brandon herrera if i'm not mistaken he built one from uh from a parts kit kind of oh there's totally legal. gray market AK yeah. parts yeah, kits yeah. coming because out of Russia because it's kind of like a, a non-functioning gun but yeah doesn't matter doesn't yeah. matter L let's not go into that but ours was a civilian version mm -hmm. which is almost identical to the military one even you even still have the the automatic sear like mm -hmm. people were noticing the three holes and everything but automatic sear is not considered illegal here you know right. it's just like it's converted and it does not Cannot shoot full auto, but you could kind of convert it if you wanted to. Um, so was it's also not built from many parts. It was no, it was like from the actual factory. Yeah. So yeah. It was, I would not know, make any claim original. that the military ones are going to be uh, substantially different in any way. Oh no, they, they, they're not. Except we also for being probably have auto. sources in Russia. We also have some sources, and like we get people then writing to us and commenting. Essentially, it's the same thing with yeah. the military version. Um, for those people that didn't watch our video, you should go watch it, but just too long didn't watch. Um, it sucks. <laughs> it doesn't suck. That, that's kind of clickbaity. It doesn't suck. It's an okay rifle, but it, it, it just like um, we say... It's a step backward from the AK-74M. Kind of. Yeah, they're, they're trying to modernize it, but they, they made it... Like, like from a poor design... Uh, bad quality of production, uh, poor uh, quality control, um, the, the top cover rail thing does not hold zero after a certain amount of rounds and if you disassemble it and put it back together, it just, it fails on all of these points and essentially it was made, it was, it was designed like this to be made very cheap, uh, to, to, you know, to produce a lot of them and then again but Russia that... failed because they issued them without optics. So right. All of those mod modifications or modernization was senseless. Yeah. Yeah, and the the argument that something is uh, made in a, a way so it's massively produ produced is not a good argument because for most of AKs that's an argument and a lot of them were doing okay. Hmm. To be honest. Now that you're a couple of drinks in, I'm getting there. 
Uh, <laughs> we have something here. Oh dear. I have the Airx. What? Already? Yeah, Airx Delta mm. Gen 2. I like this pistol. I have one of these pistols. You have? Okay. I have one and of now these. I have at a home. holster. Yes, I have a Battle Gnome Solutions holster, which is pretty awesome. Fuck yeah. Mm. Oh, this is the Mantix X, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you will have 10 shots. Oh boy. And we'll try to record your score. I checked the gun that it's, that, that it's empty, but also, you know, just what would be the best uh, in my position head, for my you. head. Yeah, maybe no. I'll move and you can I, aim there. I, okay. see, I see a little hanger thing on the wall right no, there. That's uh, a really good <laughs> aiming point. No, to, uh, the, the most safe way, uh, uh, aim there. Over here? Uh, yes, because okay. that's the supporting wall, so it's fine. <laughs> no, really, that's the support. So <laughs> I hit that, the whole apartment building's coming down. Probably. Wouldn't wouldn't it be funny if like we put a live round in and it would shoot on the podcast like that would make it, you know, no. really no, like, that go, be going viral. Viral, yes. Funny. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. I want to be famous. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Wait, 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 no, wait. No, right. it's, it's fine. So what's the procedure with this? Do I have to rack it between shots? Oh yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, but it doesn't count. Uh, um, maybe before Giga sets it up so it's not, you know, unpleasant fucking quiet in between. <laughs> so tell me a little bit more with what you have shot on uh, Lynx Brutality and what do you think about the, especially about the Arex guns? So I was originally planning to do, well, I was originally planning to do a different rifle, but when Fab from Bloke on the Range showed up with a FAMAS, you're All like, other plans go out the window. I'm shooting the FAMAS. Okay. So what he has is a legit FAMAS. Mm -hmm. It's down converted from full to semi, but it's not a MOS 223. It's an actual civilian sale FAMAS, which I totally have to use. That was cool. And that was really, it went with your whole outfit. So yeah, yes. yeah. Nice. yeah. And um, um, about the, 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 the secondary, about the RX. So I... When I went to Iwa, I had a chance to. T so when I went to Iwa, I had a chance to talk to the RX guys because they were in the Brownells Europe booth with us. Correcto. Um, we, we had brought what would Stoner do rifles, and like I started handling the Delta Two, Delta Gen Two, and I'm like, this is, this actually, it's pretty cool and worse. Like it's pretty neat. And so I talked to them. And they're like, yeah, we'll send you one to to tinker with. And I really came away with it quite impressed. And so I told him, hey, I'm coming out for Lynx Brutality rather than try and import export my own gun, which can be done, but, you know, it's a hassle. Yeah. Um, if you guys can arrange for me to get my hands on a, an RX Delta. And with arrange, that means having mine. Yes, it turns out it was your <laughs> pistol. Thank you very much. Oh, you shot with his pistol? Yeah. 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 And it was yeah. zeroed perfectly because you hit everything? Oh, okay. I'm Apparently. Probably, we're yeah. lefties. We're lefties. That's, that's why <laughs> there it you worked. Go. Uh, it's, I, it was great. As... Giga just spoiled. I hit everything with it. Yep. I had no problem you were on fire whatsoever with it. Was, like, and a gun that in the U.S. retails for like four hundred bucks. Yeah. Um, and at the end, uh, we also, you know, found on one a very important thing: Samo can zero uh, pistols. Th that surprised me <laughs> really. Um, okay. Um, right. Now what we have here is the Mantis X system. Uh, what it does is pretty much it, it has some gyroscopes and some sensors in the device and it's uh, monitoring your trigger press just you know a couple of milliseconds before the trigger press and during your trigger press so um, uh, it gives you a score um, okay. from 0 to 100 obviously 100 is the best and uh, essentially the calmer you are the less you move the pistol during the trigger press the better the score you have 10 shots and right. are you ready? Yeah. Almost. We're I've, looking. I've read the old school 1880s competition shooting guides. Um, it actually works. From our um, experience with Mantis for tar target <laughs> shooting, a certain amount of alcohol can really calm you down and improve the scores. Yes. You're uh, ready to go, sir. All right. Okay. And this is the, the time where it can be boring because he needs to do this stuff. 
so it's uh, the time when I need to mention uh, you can buy it in our store polinartechnical.com slash shop uh, you know 97 uh, for those who don't know that's really good that's mm, okay we, maybe we should try to uh, mess with him somehow uh, 91 okay yeah, it's already working bad. it's already working <laughs> You know that French guns, they, they really suck. <laughs> and also his channel is kind of boring. <laughs> well, that was a good one. <laughs> a lot of old shit when I'm laughing. Yeah, because at the end of the day, it's, it's a lot of old shit. Nobody shoots anymore, you know. 94. <laughs> what do you know? It's old people talking about old guns. Yes. Eh. Do you think that people on YouTube notice that he's getting great? That was like 88. 73! <laughs> that is bad! Are you aiming at the wall? Or is the wall <laughs> aiming at you? <laughs> I'm aiming at the crack in the wall. No crack in my place. I think... I think we were not um, we we're not messing with James that much. No, but James was a shit face when he did the challenge. That Ooh, was ninety six. That was better. That was good. So we can actually get into his head. Yeah, we can. We can. James was a just shit face when he did this challenge. Oh, ninety five. Um, Do you think he he would be upset if he, if ninety five again? If he if you tell him he's in like his mid to late 40s who Ian mm -hmm. oh I thought he was older <laughs> yeah 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 what was that one 99 that, that was really right. good Fuck! Yeah. that was really good now he's messing with us <clears throat> he's in his happy place yes oh 87 80, 89 ah 89 how many am I at Sorry. Uh, you're on the last shot sir Ooh, okay. yeah, it's awesome to connect with older people <laughs> Talk about generational stuff, you know? 85. Okay, so yeah. your Mantis benchmark, the whole score, the average score is 91.8. 91.8. Yeah. That's yes. a good one. No, no, that's a good one. No. Bam. I, I think you could do better if we wouldn't mess with you. Possibly. Um, I'd like to get rid of that 73 or whatever. Yeah, oh, we, will, we will delete it definitely. Jan, don't delete it. <laughs> um, so, uh, that was fun. What is this optics you're using? Uh, is the Holosun primary don't, arms Don't version. you know that's the best optics maker on the planet? Yes. Well, it's awesome. Um, let, let's remove the gun from this equation, please. <laughs> you see, every everybody in Europe in Europe is very safe and um, you know safety. Uh, how do you say safety? Stuff. doesn't matter yeah safety stuff we are safety no i just don't want like because people then watch these kind of videos and Correct like on. they can yes. they, they're starting especially to comment like oh you're muzzling that yeah. and that and especially that especially from samo because we did especially from samo yeah because <laughs> samo is very um how do you say dangerous guy dangerous okay let's continue with the questions do you have any questions for ian dude i'm so shocked Okay, you're shot. I, so. I would. Uh, so we 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 have gone from. We have gone. I have many guns. No, we. Uh, <laughs> I think some. Of <laughs> we have covered a lot of like your past and things, uh, but now because you are here, it's quite <clears throat> you know ob obvious why you're here. It's because of the Lynx brutality, um, and I would like. To talk a little bit more about it maybe okay. first for the people that don't know uh how the brutality you know came to but life let's talk, what is brutality <laughs> fucking like i hate him like the question was how no no, 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 no. Is, what is the brutality <laughs> Giga, Giga, Giga. <laughs> we'll go from 74 what is a brutality <laughs> To the future and the present, please. Right. Sorry. So how did brutality start? Yes. So the brutality matches are the evolution of the two-gun action challenge match, mm -hmm. which was, you know, was the original two clubs, I think, were like Michigan and Arizona. Um, this is something that Carl Casarda was running when I moved to Tucson and I discovered 
as uh, like, oh, this is a fun place to run classic weird old rifles. But the focus of the match is it's a rifle and pistol match with a focus on physical effort. Um, so physical activity. It involves running or uh, carrying weight, throwing things. For example, a, a classic, a couple classic stages. One would be you've got three target stands on a pistol bay and you've got a mini IPSC target on one of them. You engage the target with probably your pistol. You put the pistol down and you run down the 50 yard bay, take the target and put it on the second stand and then run back to the shooting line and engage it. Mm -hmm. And then put your pistol down, run down, move it to the third stand, run back, engage it, and then move it once more time to the first stand. So it's a self-resetting stage, which is nice. But you're doing, was that, three or 400 meters of running in the course of shooting the stage. And so you get out of breath, you get winded, your shooting will deteriorate. And that's that's kind of the fundamental core of Two Gun. The point, basically. The point is, how do you shoot under physical stress? Um, I shot these matches for years. When we started In Range TV, we had the idea of, like, it would be really cool to do, like, the Nationals equivalent of Two Gun Action Challenge mm -hmm. match. This is something that... It's become a bit more popular now, probably because of in-range, but at the time, there were almost no places outside of Arizona where you could participate in a match like this, and we wanted to open it up and sort of do a big prestige match. We, we I think we can continue. Yes, okay. we will not use that camera. Fuck you, camera! <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's where Desert Brutality came from. It mm -hmm. was, let's do eight stages, two days, the equivalent of a, a big match. Um, so we, we set it up and ran it, and it was freaking awesome. And that was five years ago, and it's been running ever since. Mm -hmm. um, that was right about the time that we got to know the guys at Varus Delica. Okay, that's what I want yeah. to talk about. Like, how did you came together? How did you, where did you talk the, you know, for the first time? And like, okay, I'm going to Finland to shoot. Yeah. So it started when we found Varostelika's website. And in particular, their descriptions of the surplus gear that they were selling, which are hilarious. Like, they're one of these great companies that they don't try to bullshit you. They're like, we have Russian World War II surplus backpacks. They're basically complete trash. <laughs> Some of them have holes in them, but they're kind of cool. And they're really simple. Like, if you want a really simple, really cheap backpack, here you go. Or the classic, iconic, uh, Yugoslavian war crimes MRE kits, <laughs> like uh, the the genocide canteen. Exactly. That yes. Was, yes. That is a good one. Um, it's just a really entertaining <laughs> website to look at, which is brilliant on their part. And so we started talking about them and posting them. And then not that much later, we went to Shot Show, and Varsilika had sent some guys over to Shot Show uh, to look for surplus to buy in the United States. And so we met them in person there at the show. And that's where we really got to know Yari and a bunch of the other people. And then you just said, like, let's do the match. And as part of meeting them, we suggested, like, hey, we're doing this desert brutality thing. Why don't you guys come next year? Mm -hmm. And they did. And they really liked it. And they thought, hey, this is awesome. We want to do the same thing in Finland. And that's where Finnish brutality started. And it's simply grown from there. Yeah. And now... Hopefully, I got all of that history right. I think I, I, think, I, that's think, I think you did. And if, like, what's awesome about the brutality? See if we can dig more into the brutality matches. Uh, it what's awesome about everything? I wasn't at, you know, every brutality out there, but they're completely different. So yeah. there were two in 2021 because of covid oh, okay the the plan was to do finish brutality in february and do mm -hmm. it properly in the snow skis you know like plan on 10 percent of the competitors freezing properly to death it was gonna be the, the winter brutality yeah exactly right? yeah. winter brutality yeah. we wanted to come but and COVID, COVID completely yeah. trashed it so what we ended up doing was we had i think six or seven people there mm -hmm. um, carl and i were both there uh, Bloke on the Range, uh, Mike and Fab from Bloke on the Range were there. And then it was a couple of guys from Varostelika. Mm -hmm. And we did a mini match. We did three of the stages um, to get content and video because we really wanted to do it. 
But then the proper public match was held later once COVID mm-hmm. restrictions okay. had, had dropped down. Uh, and this this was the first uh, Lynx brutality, so yes. basically a Slovenian brutality. Yeah. Um, what was your experience and what how different was it to other matches? Because you have been to a- every fucking brutality out there. Not quite. I've been to a lot of them. I haven't quite been to he every one. He has been to them, every right? brutality. For our um, channel, it's, like, he knows everything. There are Don't different... bullshit some, he knows. <laughs> <laughs> there are different aspects to some of them. So, um, the like, last year's desert brutality was particularly hard on the shooting challenges. Mm-hmm. Last year's finish brutality was more difficult on the physical challenges, heavier weights, a lot of strenuous movement that you had to do. Lynx brutality this year was actually a really nice balance of the two. Um, If I had to weight it one way or another, I would say it was a little bit harder on the physical than the shooting. Um, The desert brutality shooting challenges were more difficult than this. But overall, this was a really good balance of the two, where... Yeah, you're especially if you push yourself to get a good time, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to be a pretty good shot to make the shooting challenges after you've been heaving 15 kilo bags over a wall or throwing a kettlebell. Uh, it was good. It was a lot of fun. That, that that's one thing that I noticed and did not expect. Uh, I was preparing the stages, and as you know, we had to reduce a lot of the stages, uh, reduce the weights reduce the amount of times you had to carry the weights uh, and this was primarily because I did not expect that shooters would do so poorly under the rest. Yeah, Because true. I was thinking about like, oh yeah, my experience from the Finnish brutality, um, you know, like I, I, I was watching other guys like you and others that have experience uh, with shooting out of breath and shooting after, you know, doing some stressful tasks. Uh, in Slovenia and all of the foreigners that came to Lynx Brutality from Germany, Austria, France, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, like all of the other countries, um, kind of never experienced that in such a way. And they had issues with hitting targets that were that they were quite easy, yeah. I would say. They timed out on the stages that I would never expect. And essentially what happened is they got out of breath, they got, you know, like... A bit of adrenaline and they were tired and they were not able to hit rifle targets at 50 meters yeah which is mind-blowing you know Uh, but i think we had a lot of shooters this year who had never done a match like this before and it really took them by surprise Mm -hmm. and i think next year it's going to be a whole nother level of competitors because they're now they're going to know yeah the community is going to know my ideas for the stages um Uh. Yeah, watch out. Train a lot. It will be really on the next level. It's, it's going to be awesome. Mm. Uh, so the other thing about the Brutality matches that is maybe even better than the actual stage design is just the spirit of the matches. Mm-hmm. This, These are competitor versus the stages. It's not competitor exactly. versus competitor. Exactly. exactly. There is a tremendous amount of camaraderie. Even if I was perhaps vocally ecstatic when i was able to like once beat giga on a stage <laughs> the point you're there cheering your your fellow competitors on against the stage it's totally different from like the stereotypical ipsic yeah rule DQ. rule nazis and you know looking for any opportunity to get an edge over someone correct that's it's totally different it's, it, it, and it's i was mind it, it was mind blowing for me uh, even in Slovenia, when because that is our, you know, like they are, <laughs> what you said, like Nazi, uh, uh, you know, DQing everybody, whatever. Oh. He said that not like, for, for the people listening to podcast. Slovenians are not Nazis. No, definitely okay. not. Um, that came out wrong. Only, no, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> no, what I wanted to say is it was fun to see. The Slovenians involved into in in all of the positivity of the uh, of the brutality. Yeah, it was so great. even when you because we also made a, a fair uh, like a gun show, uh, everybody there was like had the mentality. Giga said uh, after the twenty twenty one, I think uh, brutality. So what he said was like it was terrible. I had fun. Uh, and yeah. everybody was like that. Oh, it's, it's awful, and it was a great time. Exactly. <laughs> and for me, that was like, 
the, the moment I realized we we did something very very nice. Yeah. And probably the next next year is gonna be even bigger, better, it, greater. It was really cool to see the involvement with all of the the firearms associated industry, the companies here in Slovenia. You had like. 15 or 20, 20 different 20, companies, 20, 20, companies 20, yeah, yeah. 20 companies on like a display fair up uh, just above the range yeah. showing product, talking to people. It was really cool. And free beer. And free beer. <laughs> it's I, very important. I, got introduced, important I got introduced to Tink Arms, yeah. which I had no, never heard of before, but they've got a really interesting rifle and that's what I'm going to be shooting at next year's Link like, Mentality. Hopefully they can uh, make it our, work. Our <laughs> mentality when it comes to this is we are the next generation when it comes to the shooting sport, uh, the, the, the companies involved with firearms in Slovenia. And we, I would personally, I would hate like the negativity that was happening right now. So it was a nice moment where people can connect and maybe build a relationship and then maybe also see that, you know, it's not just about Slovenia, you know, it's, it's about, it, it's international, you know, you can have a friendship or a partnership with somebody from Slovenia. Everybody can mer uh, learn money, or learn money, earn money. <laughs> and essentially just like, let Let's be friends. It was great. Yeah. yeah. Some some points that I took from that is um, one, we have a lot of shooters in Europe that have the guns, the equipment, even the skills and training, but they have nowhere to test it out or to train. So we we saw a lot of like high end shooters with high end gear, and I think most of them were not active military and police. Some of them, yes. But most of them were civ civilians and i think this was one of the only events in europe besides finnish brutality which is very you know remote from all of it and usually it's sold out immediately it sold out in 15 seconds yeah. this year yeah. and which is 90 percent finnish people and it's mostly finns yes. yeah so this kind of event gives them the chance to test out you know all of their gear and and actually you know use it in a proper way that's one thing the second thing um maybe we, we were not um, what? No, no, you go, you go. <laughs> Maybe we're not uh, not good enough in, in conveying the spirit of the brutality. Uh, but now that we got so much feedback from the competitors, that's exactly um, what you said. So it's a uh, competitor versus the stages. Yeah. And the arrows there help you out. Yep. They are not there just to DQ you. They are sure they are there for safety, but they will first, you know, try to give you a warning, help you out, tell you if you forgot something, uh, tell you if you need to carry this weight still to there before you shoot, so you don't get the penalty. Yep. Um, and and a lot of competitors after the match came to me and said like, this is you know this is like this kind of team spirit. They were I I, I really thought that they were there and they were cheering for me and a lot of arrows were there you know helping competitors cheering for them and and trying to pick them up even after they were really, really tired and almost, you know, quit. And that thing, I think we never realized that it was so important and it was so missing from all the comp competitions yeah. and organizations here. And yeah, it's basically ironic that like a small state, or well, not state, a country like Slovenia is, uh, you know, organized something really big and a lot of shooters were missing out on. So uh, we are really happy about it. And humbled, of course. Give me the beer, goddammit. <laughs> okay, yeah, the beer is very important. It is. Uh, for one of the last questions, because I think Simon is getting tipsy already. <laughs> um, it's again from one of our patrons, from Nate. You have two. Awesome. Yes, we oh, have right. two. <laughs> um, kind of complex question. Okay. What or where would be the best part to transition into gun industry. He's a JavaScript developer and would like to transition to gunsmithing and the industry in general. Ooh. Yes. That can be so simple, but yet so hard. So you've got two tracks. One is going to be the formal education track and one is going to be the amateur track. One option is just start doing it on your own. Um, whatever the specific, like there's a lot that gunsmithing can mean. It can mean fixing stuff. It can mean rebuilding stuff. It can mean 
building things from literal scratch. Um, so the one option is pick what you want to do and start doing it as a hobby. There is one limitation. Uh, I know that it, it, it's a fact for Slovenia. <laughs> you cannot do gunsmithing without a permit. License. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. But um, like you said, for a lot of other stuff, you start with a hobby. I would say it like that. Yeah. You know, you you cannot just I don't know leave your job and try to make something uh, without first uh, trying it out. Yeah. What country is he from? Um, I mean, he's Slovenian, but he's from Austria, I think. Yeah. Kind of. I mean, the other the other option is if you really want to jump in, risky wise with both feet, go sign up for one of the gunsmithing schools. Uh, Fairlach in Austria yeah, is really a world renowned yeah. has a world renowned gunsmithing school. There's some similar ones in Germany in a way that we don't really have in the US. Like gunsmithing in Germany and Austria is you're gonna build a gorgeous custom gun from literal nothing. Yep. Like not quite from ore, but, They're like, <laughs> but uh, from a block of steel. And end project for a lot of those yeah. gunsmiths is to make your own gun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's risky. Like if you're gonna do that, you're gonna quit your job, use your savings or something to put you through that school. And when you get out of that school, hopefully you still enjoy it. Like you've discovered that the reality of this profession is something that you enjoy and now you're going to need a job doing it. Yeah. Um, also, my point of view on that is that is a g great idea if you want to go into gunsmithing for hunting, hunting rifles, that kind of thing, because yeah, it, it's very old school. Yeah. I, I, I personally, am, if I would go into gunsmithing, I would not be interested in that thing. Like I do some modification myself, all legal, of course, but it's completely different from what they would teach you there, you know, with engraving and 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 yeah. uh, hand fitting parts together and cold bluing, hot bluing. Yeah, so my advice when I get people asking me, I get two kinds of questions. I get, I'd really like to do what you do. How do I work in firearms <coughs> history? And the answer is. You, you create your own job because there is no such thing as a formal education in firearms history. Correct, For those people, I generally suggest like, do this as a hobby. Yeah. Start playing with it on your spare time and see if you really enjoy it. I consider myself extremely fortunate and unusual that I was able to take this, which was a hobby, and turn it into far more than a full-time profession. Like, I don't, I often don't know when it's a weekend because I work seven days a week. Same for us. Because I actually enjoy what I'm doing, and I'm so fortunate that it hasn't made me burn out and lose interest. And you still enjoy what you do, right? I do. I okay. truly, truly do. That's one thing that is maybe also worth mentioning. For a lot of people, oh, yeah. transferring, transferring like from hobby to a job, it's hard. you will not enjoy it anymore. So yeah. it, that is kind of um, an important thing because... Uh, for example, we often get shooters or friends that want to go to the range with us. Oh, you're filming? Oh, which gun? Whoa, I want to go there and be there. Like, you will be bored. Trust me. You will have nothing to do there. You will not shoot. You will just be behind the camera. You'll have to sit there and you'll be bored. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and a lot of them that actually went to the range saw that it, it's... Yeah. It's kind of yeah. work. And the second, I have to it's repeat, totally yeah, work. And, yeah. I, for, and she's those, like, fuck, fuck, fuck. And then, I'm really bad with my words and, and <laughs> sometimes I forget lines. And, and at the end of the day, if I can just put my words into what you are saying, because you're actually 100% oh. correct. It's also from our experience, it's like you need to work like 10 years into something that was a hobby. So somebody can say that, you know, overnight you have made it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of yeah. dedication, a lot of, you know, weekends, uh, overnights, whatever, um, that, you know, you can kind of say that you have uh, succeeded in this uh, yeah. department. So for the people then who say, I want to get into gunsmithing, like I want to build guns for a living. My recommendation is generally to get a formal education in machining. Mm -hmm. Like, Go get your CNC mill lathe certification because in the actual industry, 
that's how you build guns. That's the qualifications that actual gun factories are looking for. They want people who can run CNC machines. And if you don't enjoy doing that, you're probably not going to be that interested in actually doing this as a career. And if you get, it's so like if you get a, if you go to Fairlock and get a gunsmithing, specific gunsmithing education, you'll be great as a gunsmith and you'll have very few other employment opportunities. You get a machining education and certification. Now you go apply to all the gun factories. And if you don't get a job there, you can go work in aerospace, in automotive, in all sorts of other Any, industries. Basically that, anywhere. And they pay well. It's a valuable skill. You have lots of other options. And you're really not selling yourself short at all when it comes to getting into the gun industry. So that's what I recommend for that. That's actually a good advice. Mm. Because well, also still, you do something else, you can still do guns. Yeah. <laughs> because you have money. So. Yeah, like worst case, you can't find a job in the gun industry. You get a job for some other factory and you build kind guns of, on your yeah, own time. Exactly. Fun fact, Think Arms. Yeah. The guy has a company building water turbines, high-end, custom-made, CNC machining, he designed them. He's like an, en you saw him, he's an engineer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He essentially knew nothing about guns. And five years before, came to us and said like, I want to build a gun. <laughs> and okay, started then. from scratch. He only had his machining knowledge, CNC and this kind of thing, and he started to tinker. And, and that's why also his, the name of the company, Think Arms, uh, it's not from that, it's from his nickname, doesn't matter, but it so fits. But it's such a perfect coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Um, so yeah, but he had, you know, this kind of backing from his other company, he had the money to start working on that. Oh, but essentially, the best way to make a million dollars making guns is to start with two million dollars and open a gun company. <laughs> you'll lose a million dollars, you'll go out of business, and you'll still have a million. That, that's why they say about uh, rally drivers, you know, how to become a millionaire, yeah. uh, you know, doing rally, it's uh, starting off as a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, last question, maybe because I think this podcast is long enough. Oh um, yeah, let's go eat. Yeah, we. Need to it is time for dinner. Yeah. So how would you? Last question for from me. Then Gigo will say it somewhere you're drunk. Um, <clears throat> Some of you're drunk. <laughs> yes. Last question is how would you promote in our name, uh, Link's brutality for next year? What's what would I tell people about yes. it, or yeah, 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 how yeah. should you promote it? No, how? No, no, no. What would you tell people from your experience doing the no. first year? Um, I think it's a fantastic opportunity to get into what I think is the most enjoyable style of match. Um, I really like the idea of combining physical fitness and physical activity with shooting skills. Um, it's exciting. It's fun. It's a proper challenge in a way that a lot of shooting skills. I mean, this is me personally. A lot of the, the precision shooting, it, it doesn't interest me as much. I really like adding the physical aspect to it. So if you're in Europe, especially, Finnish brutality is great. But as we already mentioned, literally this year it sold out in 15 seconds. It's mostly Finns who are super into it. And it's very hard to get into. Lynx brutality is the opportunity to get in at the ground level of a match like this that... You know, this was the first year. Next year is going to be only the second year. Um, I have every confidence that it's going to be really even more awesome next year. And you should definitely get in on it uh, before they sell out. <laughs> that is awesome. That Very good a... sales pitch. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the podcast. And thank you just for coming to Slovenia. Mm. I really had an awesome time hanging out with you, nerding out about all of the firearms and other stuff. Um, thank you very much. I hope we see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you for being you. <laughs> Just being a normal fucking guy. Thank you. Perfect. Thank uh, you for watching. See you soon. Bye-bye. Cut.